What up? What is happening? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, and we have been booking a lot of guests lately. And the one that is live on Hoppy Hour right now, I am very proud to have. He is from the CW44 in Tampa Bay. He is their resident movie critic and overall badass. TM Powell is here. What's up, dude? What's up, Ryan? How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. So uh, thank you for coming by. You're the movie critic, and um. I'm very happy to have you here because I don't know a lot about, like, pop culture. So I feel like you're the guy that could teach me about it because I know too much about, like, radio and sports. But I feel like I need to learn more about pop culture. You know what I mean? Well, I used to say I had the useless gift because I know all this stuff about pop culture. But, unfortunately, I, don't, I wish it was, like, curing cancer or, you know, <laughs> something like an engineer or do something great. But I know a lot about movies, so I might as well just run with it. And before we get to everything that came out this summer and all the movies that are coming out in the winter, I want the radio world to get to know you because I have listeners in Chicago, Cleveland, Rochester. So where did you grow up as a kid? Actually, I grew up in Virginia uh, in a town called Fredericksburg. And I grew up there. I was close friends with Danny McBride from East Bound and Down. I've been, really? Yeah, childhood friends with him. And uh, me and him both just loved movies growing up. Uh, we always, you know, kind of were drawn to each other, you know. It, you know, it wasn't like we were nerds or anything like that, yeah. but behind the scenes, we were, you know, undercover geeks because back then it wasn't cool to be a nerd. It's cool to be a nerd now. I oh, love yeah. it. <laughs> but back then, you know, in the mid 90s, early 90s, not so much. But uh, yeah, him and I just love movies. I mean, we were the guys that were sneaking into Basic Instinct, not because of the crotch shot, because we heard it had a really good story. Uh, that's just how we were. And uh, he went to film school, became an actor, and I came here and be a film, <laughs> film critic at Tampa, so I think he won that you know battle. But uh, you know, we still stay close with him. But yeah, I started working at the CW behind the scenes as a street teamer, uh, like a lot of people do. I have a, you know, I, I I like you know the promo people. I'm always trying to be nice to them because I was there too. I try not to shun them. I try to get to know everybody, and then work behind the scenes. I always wanted to be on camera, just never really worked out. Got an opportunity, uh, writing for the website. It went from there. Some guys like Calta and Drew noticed me. Helped me along in the beginning, put me out there, and I, I've seemed to have found a niche, and it's really cool. Going back to Danny McBride, when was the last time you saw him? Have you gone to a few of his movie premieres? When was the last time you saw Danny? Oh, man, the last time I saw Danny was uh, probably about two, three years ago at Christmas time. He threw a party at home, and I went home for Christmas. My oh, parents nice. don't parents don't live in my hometown uh, anymore, so... I used to go home and visit them at the holidays, and he, you know, basically ran out of bar, and we'd all have a party. I get to hang out with them a couple of days, but you know, for us, I don't. I, he's definitely a movie star. I mean, he's just, yeah. you know, it, that's how it is. But there's a part of me where we're just kind of hanging out, you know, BSing about movies. He's still the same guy I grew up with. I mean, I was in his wedding party. I went to his wedding in Palm Springs, and yeah, I didn't. I kind of really take in that my friend had basically booked out a whole hotel in Palm Springs, <laughs> and uh, hey, you know, had us all out there, and you know you know, paid for a bunch of things and had, you know, basically open parties. And, you know, I still look at him as like, you know, he's just my buddy that, you know, we were seeing movies with, you know, on a Friday night and probably instead of seeing girls like we should have been. Was it cool to like see him get his big break when he played Kenny Powers on Eastbound and Down? Because to me, that's when he exploded, you know? It was definitely when he exploded. I went out to Sundance one year with him and when he sold the Foot Fist Way, which is his yeah. first thing. And, you know, that got him noticed because, uh, Ben Stiller and a couple people have taken notice of him. I know a lot of people think it's Will Ferrell, and definitely Will helped him along. Yeah. But, you know, Ben helped him along, too. You know, he was in The Heartbreak Kid. He was uh, also in Tropic Thunder, which was big for him. But, yeah, it was cool to see him blow up. I mean, I'm crazy proud of him. And Pineapple Express will always be a special movie to him because there's, you know, some remarks in there, uh, you know, where you know he says some stuff that was right out of our childhood when I know they were improv. And, and every once in a while you hear a Mr. Powell reference in Hot Rod. And uh, at one time, I think, in the Foot Fist Way, and if you look in the outtakes, you can see prize students and there's TM Powell written in the background. So he'll leave Easter eggs for me. We still bounce stuff off of each other, too. So he'll ask about what he thinks about a role and or he'll ask if I've seen something. It's kind of tough, you know, when he's in a bad movie, and I have to be honest about it. But it's great when he's in a good movie like This is the End because I get to pound my chest and be so proud of him. When you go to, to like, some of his parties, what is it like? Like, what's the food there? What's the <laughs> vibe like? I've always wanted to go to a rich person's party, especially a celebrities. So what's it like when you first walk in the door? Well, it, you know, it's funny because a lot of his friends out there are down to earth. I mean, he had Seth Rogen at his wedding. I had a long conversation with him. Very normal, nice guy. Laughs like that in real life, which blew me away. I always <laughs> thought that was an act. But that, uh, that is for real. <laughs> I heard that. Uh, but the guys from Lonely Island were great. I mean, being in the wedding, you had people come up and seeking you out to say, hey, I want to introduce yourself. And yeah. I turn around, and there's you know Andy Sand Lance Sandler introducing himself to oh, me because I'm in the wedding, Andy Sandberg. And you know they were just really cool guys and down to earth. 
Franco was there. Uh, you know, Franco's a different dude, and Danny had even said, you know, hey, listen, James is a little different. Just be prepared. And he definitely was different. Um, but people like Craig Robinson were out there as well. Just really good guys. He's a good guy at heart. He's a normal guy from a small town. So I'm not surprised he has normal friends out there that don't really buy into the whole Hollywood scene. How did you relocate from a small town in Virginia to coming to a major market at Tampa Bay? Did you move here for college? How did that happen? Well, after college, uh, I had two options. Uh, one of them was to go out to California and Los Angeles where Danny was at. Now, the problem with that was he was about to be in this movie called All the Real Girls, and he wasn't going to be there. So I was going to be on my own in Los Angeles for probably about six months. And I'm not going to lie, it scared me back then. I had a leasing consultant down here uh, that I was friends with from high school that knew she could get me an apartment, and it was simple enough. Of, I just moved down here and said, hey, let's see if it works out. Let's see if I make it. I worked at WQIK, which was a, the biggest country station, one of the biggest stations in town at the time, and I worked there part-time, did a little bit of call-ins, different things like that, but worked behind the scenes at CW and kind of just went from there. But, yeah, it was it was a struggle at first because, I mean, I was working three part-time jobs, not making anything. You know what it's like when yeah. you're starting out and just praying that you're going to get full-time, just praying someone's going to notice you. It took me about eight years, but it finally happened. Who were some of your influences? Like, for me, I like Opie and Anthony, Mike Kelta, guys from Chicago that are on the radio. Who were some of your influences to go into pop culture? Was it like Roger Ebert or Leonard Maltin? Is that the movie critic? Leonard Maltin. Yeah, for me, it was Ebert. I liked Roger Ebert a lot. Uh, I don't write like him at all. He's a way smarter guy than I ever was, but I like that he had a different take on it, and that's what I try to do as well. I actually went and... For a week during spring break in high school, Danny and I went and did a seminar uh, where they talked about Pulp Fiction for a whole week at the University of Virginia, and Roger Ebert was the host, and he broke it down. He showed us all these tricks and how Tarantino rips off everybody. But I like him. You know, I like Roger Ebert a lot. He's definitely a Vico heroes. I hate you throwing that word around heroes because it should be somebody like your dad, you know, or a big brother, whatever it is. But when it comes to, like, your media heroes, you know, Roger Ebert was one for me. I like Tarantino a lot, too, just because the guy was a video clerk. Uh, vi- I'm sorry, video clerk. You know, pop, you know, culture junkie just like I am, you know, and just, you know, said, hey, I'm going to do this. And the other guy I like is Mick Foley. I've been very honest about this because I know Mick Foley was, you know, a pro wrestler. But, you know, he wrestled in sweatpants. He didn't look like all the other guys. He wasn't in the best shape in the world. But he still proved he could be a heavyweight champion just by his personality. And that's what I try to do. What is it about Quentin Tarantino that makes him such a special movie director? Well, probably because he had no background in it. And, I mean, he just kind of started ripping off other stories and throwing them into screenplays. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, he does rip off certain things, but it, he rips it off because he's a fan of it. He's not ripping it off to steal it. He rips it off, it's almost like an ode to it. And, uh, you know, people told him, hey, this isn't going to work out. He makes Reservoir Dogs with some pretty decent actors at yeah. the time and even better now when you look back. And then he hits with Pulp Fiction, and, I mean, that thing is huge. And he had sold a couple screenplays before that. You know, he wrote Natural Born Killers. And he wrote True Romance. Now, you know, Natural Born Killer, he said, I don't want really anything to do with it. They've changed around. But he wrote True Romance, which is a great movie. He's just a guy that just decided, hey, I'm going to do this. And it inspired other people. I mean, I think Kevin Smith was probably the same way, too, because he basically made clerks with credit cards. What is the worst movie that Quentin has ever made? Because he's made a ton of gems, like Kill Bill, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs. But what is one movie where you look back and you're like, dude, you probably shouldn't have made that? Well, it's funny for me. Uh, personally, for me, I'm not the biggest fan of Inglorious Bastards, and I know some people are like, oh, my gosh, because Christopher <laughs> Waltz is awesome. I mean, I could listen to that guy read the phone book. But it's a lot of subtitles. You know, they jump around. It just wasn't a film for me. I understand why everyone likes it, but it wasn't a film for me. That's the only one that kind of sticks out for me. But I think if you ask the public which one he screwed up with, probably Jackie Brown, even though I like that movie. I think it's a good movie. It just doesn't seem to one that stands out like yeah. a Kill Bill, Pulp Fiction, or uh, Django Unchained is awesome. I, I I don't think we realize how great of a movie that is because we love movies like Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs so much, but Django's awesome. All right, since you are the movie critic of the CW44, you get paid to see all the movies that come out. So let's begin. What were some of the most overrated movies from the summer 2015 movie season? Well, if you go the festival route, there's this movie called Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl that came yeah. up with a lot of Oscar buzz and Sundance. I, I just thought it was slow. I mean, I, I really did. I thought it was just a slow movie. I get what it was about. You know, it's supposed to show that, you know, cancer's grueling, cancer's horrible, and it's it's not always the nicest life when you're going through chemo. I get that, but that doesn't always mean it's an entertaining watch. Yeah. So as far as that goes, yeah, that one was, you know, 
That that was a little disappointing. Overrated wise, I'll never understand why people go see the Minions. <laughs> I'm just not a Minions fan. I don't get it, but people love them, and they make bank. I knew they would. Uh, what's funny is a movie that surprised me was you know a movie that I did like. I'm still shocked that Jurassic World made the money it did. It, it's a fun movie, but to make six hundred million, I know prices are inflated, and we have three yeah. D and IMAX and everything else. But man, you break six hundred million domestically. That's a huge number. I didn't see that movie. How did it compare to the originals? Like, did it? Because I know the third one that came out was absolute crap. The one that came out in like two thousand and one. Yeah, with so, Taylor. Did that redeem itself from the last movie? Oh yeah, it definitely redeemed itself. The best thing they did was realizing they were never going to match the original. I love that original. I think it's a special yeah. movie. It's one of those ones that just blew us away, where we thought the dinosaurs were real back then because <laughs> we just never seen anything like that. And uh, I think the best thing they did is realize they're never going to match that, so let's have fun. Kind of like the Fast and the Furious MO, where they know they're flying cars out of planes now. They're in on the joke. They're in on the joke a little bit in Jurassic World, but it's still a good time. I mean, it's dinosaurs eating people. You know, that's fun. Or what did you think of the hype going into the Entourage movie? I was geeked out. I hadn't been that geeked out probably since the Simpsons movie. And the funny part about it was... I got free tickets to go see it at the premiere at the West Shore Plaza back in May, and I was so giddy. I loved every second of it. When the movie ended at the award show, I was sad. But you look at the numbers, it didn't do well. I mean, it didn't make enough money to redeem itself for how much it costed to make. So would you consider it a bust? Well, you know, it didn't cost that much to make, and it kind of just made its money back. Yeah. And I, I liked it. I thought it was I a good time. I was at the same premiere. I love the ending, you know, yeah. with the whole thing with Johnny Drama. I'm a big Kevin Dillon guy. He was one of my favorite characters oh, yeah. in that show. I like the stuff with Ari. I think those last two seasons on television hurt it. I mean, they just weren't very good, and it was really stumbling at the end. You know, the whole Sasha Banks storyline. Uh, you that know, was the worst. Yeah. Even... Sasha Gray. I'm sorry, Sasha Gray. Sasha Cares. Banks is Beyonce. Sasha Gray. You know what I'm talking about. And, uh, I wasn't crazy about that storyline, and plus it is a bro show. It doesn't have a following like Sex and the City. Sex and the City is a monster where those women are going to show up, have parties, just like a Magic Mike movie. Guys don't say, hey, let's go have a watch party with Entourage. <laughs> we just go see Entourage. But, yeah, it, it definitely disappointed out there because I think there was a lot of hype around it, and the fact that they don't cost a lot of money to make made me think they would make more, but I'm not so sure anymore. Why is it that movies like the Simpsons movie and the Entourage movie – there are shows where the last seasons are absolute crap or pretty mediocre, but once the movie comes out, the Simpsons movie was just as funny as the Simpsons was in the 90s, and the Entourage movie was like Entourage from season one through probably season four. Why do they wait until the movies to come out to make it funny again? You know what I mean? Well, you know, you get the creative juices going. You put a lot more into it. Also, you're not concentrating on a whole season that may have 13 episodes. could have 22 if you're on regular network television. You have two hours to make a good story. and I mean, the Simpsons movie I like, and it did well at the box oh, office. It. And the nostalgia factor plays into that. It's just like when it went to FXX, and you saw you know, a year ago, everyone's there tweeting the night where all the old episodes were on, when the marathon's on. People were falling in love with it. When you're on that long, you're going to have a stretch where that was a part of your life probably. Yeah. And I think that's why it works out well. And the Simpsons are an, you know, an easy one to like. But listen, we have The Man from Uncle next week. That's a great story. I want to see that. Yeah, it's a really cool idea, and that television series is a cool television series, and I'm always into that. Always adapt the television series that are cool, but maybe not many people know about. Like The Fugitive is a perfect example. When you try to you know, remake The Jetsons in live action or The Flintstones, you have nowhere to go but down because expectations are so high. I can't wait for The Man from Uncle because when I saw the movie trailer, I saw that Guy Ritchie made it, and I love Guy Ritchie. I love Snatch, and I love... Um, Lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. And rock and roll. Yeah. I loved rock and roll. I know that didn't get the best ratings, but I love that movie. So what should we look forward to with The Man from Uncle? Have you seen it yet? I have not seen it yet, but I know some people have seen it with some word of mouth. So it just hasn't worked out my schedule. When you're seeing a yeah. lot of movies, sometimes you miss the early screenings because you have to see the movies that are going on that week. Uh, I have not seen it. I think it's going to have a hard time finding an audience. I mean, an army hammer's in it. The guy looks like he should be a movie star, but for some reason he just can't break out. The Lone Ranger failed. He was great in the social network as the uh, Winklevi twins, the Winklevis. I'm looking at him right now. I've never heard of him. Yeah, he's one of those guys. That's, he was in uh, Entourage. He was the, uh, he was whatchamacallit's girlfriend, the one from Gone Girl. Remember that shows up at the dinner party? He's oh, like the big yeah. dude. That's Army Hammer, yeah. <laughs> so he's in it. I just think it's going to have a hard time finding an audience. I think the last 
big movie of the summer that's really going to make an impact? I mean, I'm not talking about Jurassic World money, but just you know, culturally make an impact. Have people talking about it straight out of Compton? Why is that movie going to do as well? To me, I see that being a bust. I think it'll do all right, but I don't see it being like huge. Why do you see it being so popular? Well, because I think it has a crossover a- appeal to it, where there's definitely you know you have your African American based audience that yeah. would obviously probably want to see it, but you're also going to have a Caucasian audience that's want to see it, like me, who grew up with them, who oh, wanted yeah. to rebel against parents by listening <laughs> to Straight Out of Compton, by listening to things like Two Live Crew, and it is an interesting story and i mean i just think that could be the last one where's the impact because i think it can actually cross over some generations and plus you know people still saying f the police i mean it just happens it's horrible today because people are like oh no you shouldn't say that but trust me when you're by yourself odds are you'll pop on that wa sing along with it and i think that's why people like it were you a big rap fan back in the 90s yeah absolutely i mean there's a lot of bad rap in the early 90s i mean they're just it's it i look back on I almost think it's kind of charming like the 80s how bad it was rap was still figuring itself out and then gangster rap comes along and changes it all with the chronic in 91 92 you know you have snoop dogg come into the mix and that whole gangster rap took over again it because it had been there with uh you know nwa but in a lot of ways nwa was like well, they were a cult rap that got big yeah you know they really were i mean the, people didn't really know them and then all of a sudden they burst out and they were this you know you know, very, you know, scary band out there and everything else. When you look back now, it's kind of funny when Ice Cube's in these family movies yeah. and think about how scared they were of them. But, yeah, no, I like rap. Uh, I think it's gone downhill a lot. I hate oh, to sound yeah. like an old man. I think it's gotten lazy. But, uh, you know, I, I'm even a fan of late 90s rap where a lot of people make fun of the Master P movie, Puff Daddy, you know, Biggie. I like that pop rap. It doesn't bother me. I thought pop rap was good. Well, obviously, if I grew up with it, I'm going to like it. But Ludacris, 50 Cent, Eminem, Chingy, I liked all the top 40 rap. But once, like, Soldier Boy showed up and cranked that Soldier Boy, all that crap, to me, that's when rap went downhill. And then when Lil Wayne got really popular, in the beginning, I liked Lil Wayne. But once Auto-Tune came into the scene, to me, that's when music died, so I blame Bieber. Yeah, that's a big part of it. And yeah, you know, when he was with Juvenile, Little Wayne was pretty cool. I oh, mean, yeah. I mean, he was, I mean, he was, you know, in the Bling Bling video, I loved it. But now, I mean, it's just uh, that slur, and I, I just don't get it. It just seems lazy to me. There are some people out there still trying to do it. Like, I think Kendrick Lamar's cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's some people out there that are cool. They're still trying to make an impact in music. But look at rock. I mean, rock's just dead. I mean, just no, if it wasn't for, think about it, if it wasn't for the Foo Fighters, who's out there? Who's really out there? I don't know because I don't listen, so you have a good point. Yeah, I mean, you don't listen. You're a young. How old are you, Ryan? 21. 21. I, I mean, is there any rock band besides the Foo Fighters that has meant anything to you in your life? No. Yeah, I mean, it's... Linkin it, Park, maybe. They yeah. are Blink-182. And they do an album with Jay-Z. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, so they still cross over to a point and do a lot of electronic music, and, you know, it's not all traditional instruments playing. I met those guys. They're great guys. But, yeah, I mean, rock is just done. And I've always said if the Foo Fighters were to end today, I mean, there's no one. I mean, I know some people are going to be like, oh, no, there's all these great bands. I'm talking about the mainstream that keeps, you know, genres alive. I mean, it's gone. To me, techno music is the new rock when it comes to going to shows. I think so, too. And getting high for, like, our generation, which I sort of like techno music. It can be fun to listen to, but it's gotten way too mainstream within yeah. the last 10 years and now it's just crap anybody can be a dj and people don't go to listen i actually like dance music to listen to most people go to these shows just to do molly it's ridiculous dude yeah look at the sunset music festival i mean that thing's huge i mean humongous the people that show up down there i don't mind it it's more like background music for me exactly. I, could, I couldn't imagine like downloading on itunes and just sitting around writing a movie review listening to that music back there <laughs> But if I'm around it, it doesn't bother me. Country music offends me way more than that. Put it that way. <laughs> Don't even get me going on that. Any dude who listens to it, I will say this right now, is trying to bang some girl. <laughs> there is not one dude out there. There might be some. There's not one dude who loves that music so much that he will go to a show by himself. They only do it because all the girls at all these shows are smoking hot in their short shorts and their cowboy hats. Dude, we have to be honest here. That's music for women, and dudes listen just for the girls. Would you agree? Well, I don't know, man. I grew up in Virginia and then went to college at WVU. I mean, there's a lot of dudes that love some country music. But, yeah, that's a big part of it because I remember when I did work at the country station down here, I was, like, so miserable because I was going to work, like, 12 hours at a Toby Keith concert. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's going to be horrible. Then the girls started to show up. 
and I could just could not get over it. I mean, they're gorgeous at the shows. That's what I always say. If you get stuck going to a country concert and you're a single guy, you are going to have a great time, even if the music's horrible. Yeah, I just don't get it. I like what Mike Kelta does with um, the redneck bingo. I just, but it's so true. I know. Like, I think there's a part of that that it's a lot of fun. We laugh at it, but I, I think it exposes it. Now, and listen, I know some people love country music, uh, and it's just not for me. But I will say this about it: you see a lot of people that don't work out in other genres that go to country music and succeed again because I, I think it's an easy, you know, it's an easy type of music to succeed because there's not much to it. I'm sorry, that's just my opinion. And now I want to get back to all the movies from the summer. What were some of the most underrated movies and some of the most disappointing movies to you that came out since May? Oh, you know, it's funny. Everyone thinks I hate Ant-Man. I didn't hate Ant-Man. I just thought Ant-Man was just okay. And part of the reason, you know, people thought I hated on it is because I was hard on it. And it's because Marvel set the bar high. We had a year where we had the Winter Soldier and Guardians come out in the same year. And you saw, actually, the Avengers Age of Ultron, you know, take a little bit of flack for maybe not being as good or as special as those two movies. So maybe to me, Ant-Man was a little disappointing because I kind of wanted it to rise above it. Now, the thing that surprised me the most, there's two of them. Uh, One of them would be Mad Max Fury Road. Awesome. Just a great movie. I think, you know, Hollywood forgot that we like to see things get blown up for real. And uh, Mad Max Fury Road is awesome. And the other one's Trainwreck. I thought Trainwreck was great. That's not really a movie geared towards me. And I still liked it a lot. Amy Schumer impressed me. That, and the fact that I knew she could be funny. You know, she's not always my cup of tea when it comes to stand-up comedy. She's hot or cold with me. But I knew she could be funny. Her dramatic side in that is what won me over. I thought Schumer was great. I don't know. I didn't like Trainwreck that much. To me, she was very good yeah. at that funeral. Her oh, man, that funeral scene impressed me. Oh, I know. I couldn't believe it. But I didn't think she was that funny. And I thought they used Bill Hader in the wrong way. To me... When LeBron James and John Cena are funnier than you in a movie, it wasn't that good of a movie. To me, she was trying way too hard to have edgy jokes for women about sex. And then it was like they tried too hard to be like bridesmaids. I like Amy Schumer. I like Inside Amy Schumer, the show. I like when she was on Opie and Anthony or Howard Stern. But to me, I thought she tried too hard in that movie to, like, set the tone for her career do you know what i mean yeah and like i said it's not geared towards us i mean it really isn't that's yeah. that's a girl movie that's a chick movie that's a love story too i mean that's what it is oh, yeah. it's <laughs> it's a romantic comedy that's what judd apatow does he kind of makes it a little raunchy like a 40 year old virgin uh you yeah. know and uh, knocked up and then he kind of tricks you by saying hey this is actually a romantic comedy he's really good at that he does adult comedies i hate to be the guy that says age you but there are some movies that yeah i liked when i was you know younger and i watch them now i'm like Oh, now I get it. Uh, you know, you know, I like it a lot more. Like which movies? Well, I think The Big Chill is a big one. Uh, that's an old movie, 1980, but it's just about a bunch of friends get together after one of their friends killed themselves. And, you know, they've kind of been successful at life, but, it, you know, I'm in my, you know, mid-30s now, so I kind of relate to it a little bit more. I used to love St. Elmo's Fire growing up, and then after I left college, I thought St. Elmo's Fire was, like, one of the most depressing movies ever because, <laughs> just like them, I kind of wanted to go back to college, <laughs> so... I'm looking at Twitter right now. Miles Teller is trending, and I'm glad he is because I wanted to ask you about him. What is your take on Miles Teller? I can't tell what I think of him. He was in that one movie, 21 and Older, which was like another version of The Hangover, but it was terrible. And he was okay in Project X. I actually kind of liked it because it was so silly. It was funny. But what do you think about him trying to be a superhero? I'm not sure if it's going to work out. Well, after I leave the hoppy hour here, I will be going to see Fantastic Four. And I can tell you this about Miles Teller. He was in my favorite movie I saw last year, and that's Whiplash. I mean, Whiplash yeah. is awesome. Not that many people saw it, but it's a great, great movie. But there are other times where I look at him, like in that awkward moment, I'm like, oh, I, I didn't, this isn't good at all. But there's another independent movie called The Spectacular Now with Shane Lee Woodley that he's in that I think is awesome. He's got potential but, you know, there's some actors that can do, you know, certain roles, and there's some that can't. I could never see Julia Roberts playing, like, an action role, could you? I mean, she's never going to play. Or even Reese Witherspoon. I don't see Reese Witherspoon doing comedy either. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everyone's built to do different things. Uh, we'll see how the whole superhero thing works out. You know, because he was in Divergent, too, in the Insurgent movies. He kind of plays the heel in those movies. Uh, I just thought he was kind of okay. That's really not him. Those movies are just bad. What did you think, or I know you hated the vacation movie, but why do they keep making these remakes where they're not going to be good? Like, let's be honest, Ghostbusters is going to be crap. I don't think it's going to be very good. So why do they keep making these remakes? Like, what happened to creativity in movies? Well, you know, they run out of ideas. It's easier. 
Uh, you get some people sometimes do saying that we need remakes, believe it or not. I think there's some films down the road. Like, you know, Big Trouble in Ch- Little China, I like. But I always said that could, you know, use the remake treatment. It could probably be pretty cooler. I mean, we were very limited in the 70s and 80s. It was a lot of practical effects. Uh, but, yeah, they run out of a lot of ideas. But now when it comes to Marvel, I don't think that they just don't have any original ideas. I think that there was great ideas sitting in Marvel for years. It's just their characters are so complex and yeah. their powers, you had to have great special effects to make those movies, and we couldn't do it. Now, we can do it, because we have all those special effects, so it's a lot better. So I don't think that they're, you know, oh, it's nothing unoriginal. I just think they're finally getting their chances to get made, and we're seeing this, you know, superhero resurgence. It doesn't bother me at all. But when it comes to some of these remakes, yeah, just leave them alone. Why? There's some movies that are great. That's why I'm glad I've never seen The Breakfast Club get remade. Have you ever seen The Breakfast Club? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of those movies that's timeless, because kids' problems always stay the same no matter what decade it is. Yeah. And and just don't mess with it. It's like Ferris Bueller. Don't mess with it. And I think Vacation's a perfect example because it was a reboot, sequel, whatever you want to call it. The main thing it was is just not funny and not good. Like, did you lose respect for Ed Helms when he won in that? Because I was a huge fan of him in The Hangover. I liked him in The Office. I just don't get why he would even want to try and replace Chevy Chase and make a new one for 2015. When I saw the commercial, when I saw it during the Entourage movie, I thought it looked funny, but then I kept watching the same commercial, and you're like, that's probably the only funny jokes in the movie. What we saw in those trailers is, is were the funny scenes. Those were their big funny scenes. And if you see it enough, you know, that just happens. Trailers ruin a lot of things these days. Like, if I was Mission Impossible, I would have never shown that plane scene. I, I it, and it's in the opening scene of the movie. I hate to spoil it to you, but it's in the opening scene. It's right off the bat, so I'm not yeah. spoiling You're going to see it no matter what. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes when that happens, you're kind of waiting around for that scene to happen, and it's no surprise you, you spoil too much. But when you were going back to Ed Helms, I mean, Ryan, if someone puts $5 million in front of you and says, hey, go remake The Goonies or, you know, or go remake, you know, Bad Boys, I mean, you're going to do it. I mean, that's just the way it is. You're going to do it. I mean, it's a lot of money, and it's opportunities. And what if it does hit? You're the person that yeah. revived Vacation. Look, look at The Rock. He revived the Fast and the Furious franchise. You could be that person, but, man, it's risky. It's really risky. During the movie season of September and October, to me, that's when things kind of slow down and not as many movies come out. But are there any coming out around then that we should look forward to in the fall? Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, There used to be two dead zones. The one dead zone was pretty much, you know, second week of January till, man, almost like April. I mean, April or May is where it picked up. That's going away because we see movies like the Lego movie hit big. I mean, even SpongeBob made a ton of movies. American Sniper was huge. We're going to have Deadpool in February next year. We're going to see it happen. But right now, yeah, I always say it's about the second week of August till October is the dead zone. It's because we don't care. We all love football this time of year. That's what we like. Everybody's football crazy. Kids are going back to school. People are going back to college. We've got other stuff on our minds besides movies. But I've said all along, this summer, yeah, the Tons of money been made, but there wasn't that like special film like a Guardians that just stepped out where we were like, man, this is awesome. Like Emma saw it. We just we really haven't had that. Jurassic World was kind of like that, but like I said, I'm still shocked that it made as much money as it did because yeah. it has so many flaws in it. It's fun, but it has some flaws. But I, I've said every I've told everybody keep an eye on this fall. Probably about I don't know, I'd say about mid October all the way through May. Because we're going to have some great movies. I mean, we have Spectra, which is James Bond. That's going to be oh, awesome. Uh, the, the Hunger Games. Listen, I like The Hunger Games. A lot of people don't. I like The Hunger Games. That's going to conclude. That's going to be a big deal. Pixar has another movie, The Good Dinosaur. And the big one in December is Star Wars. I mean, it's huge. Are you into Star Wars? I know you're younger. So I, I meet a lot of people who are younger that aren't into it because you guys got the crappy prequels. We got the good stuff. I don't know. I just saw the prequels. It kind of ruined it for me, but I will go see it. You should. J.J. Abrams is a good guy. He's want to revive it. Do you like the original trilogy, our trilogy? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's a great movie. It holds up. The Empire Strikes Back is one of my favorite movies. That is a big, big one to look out after. But we're going to have more like Quentin Tarantino's Hateful Eight could be really cool. Oh, yeah. That, that could be a whole lot of fun seeing that with that cast. Deadpool in February, like we talked about. Batman v Superman in March, and then Captain America Civil War in the beginning of May. We're going to get a lot of cool movies in, in a stretch where we usually don't see a whole lot. That's award season, and we're still going to get all those great award films. But I think people have realized that November is a big month with the holidays to see movies. And I, Ryan, I used to get a lot of complaints where between January 
and uh, March, people would say, why are there no good movies? There's nothing to do at yeah. winter everywhere. Why aren't there any good movies? And I used to say, I don't know. And now I think studios realize with the Lego movie, with American Sniper, that they'll still spend their money this time of year oh, on yeah. movies if you put good movies out. And I like it. I like that there's no dead zone. Give us good movies all year round. I'm good for that. What do you think about the movie that's going to come out, Joy, with Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper? Does that look good to you? Uh, you know, that's I think that's the one that they fought against. They didn't want to come out. I, is that the one? There's one that they had that they didn't want to come out. And then Jennifer Lawrence has another one later on in the year. Uh, you know, Lawrence is one of those girls that every time she does a movie now, people are going to have their eyes on it. I mean, she's basically a kid in this business and already has an Academy Award and has three nominations. You know, you look at someone like Meryl Streep, she has 19 and won three. She's just 24. She's My 24. Goodness. She's just two years older than me, essentially. Three, and just wow. think about that. Three nominations, and she's won one. So, I mean, she's doing pretty good. And not only that, she's winning. Uh, this is what I say about Jennifer Lawrence. People don't do what Jennifer Lawrence is doing right now. You're either a big franchise girl or you're in, like, you know, college teen roles or you're, you know, that actor's actor like a Natalie Portman was. And yeah. Portman got to do it a little bit with Star Wars. They just weren't very good. But Lawrence is in these huge franchises and in these, you know, pieces that can win her Academy Awards, and she excels in them all. It's incredible. Now, I want to get your take on this. Or, um, I've always been just kind of like, sort of, like, curious what people that are into pop culture think of this, but... Like, what are some of your favorite adult cartoons? Do you watch any? Like, adult cartoons? What do you mean? Like, dirty cartoons? Yeah, or like, like Simpsons. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, I thought you yeah. were like, porno cartoons. Oh, no. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not into that, right? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> um, no. Uh, some adult cartoons? Well, I man, I loved Aqua Teen Hunger Force over oh, the years. Oh, my God, yeah, dude. Yeah, I loved Aqua I Teen. I loved the Fred Aliens episode with yeah. Edson Oswald. Have you seen that one? That's great. I mean, all those, the Moon Knights. Uh, Carl next door. I mean, I've always loved Aqua Teen Hunger Force. I just think it's brilliant. I think it's perfect because it's about 12 minutes long each episode. That's oh, yeah. all it needs to be. Because any longer you're going to be like, dude, this is a milkshake and french fries. What the hell am I doing watching this? So it's not that bad. But yeah, that's one I liked. Um, you know, The Family Guy is a good show. You know, it kind of repeats itself a little bit, but there are stretches of The Family Guy where it can be really funny. American Dad's better. You know, I could not get into American I Dad. Love I love American Dad. I think that's one of those shows where that Seth MacFarlane too much off the leash where it's just too much well here's the part about it that i like he actually has nothing to do with that show the first two seasons were his product yeah and then he gave up on it so that's why you see a plot yeah, i've heard that i have heard that because that heck has nothing to do with it i am not a seth mcfarlane fan every show he does is about a dysfunctional family and he was clearly inspired by the simpsons and he has that new show coming out border town or whatever yeah. It's like it's about a dysfunctional family again. It's like the Cleveland show never should have came out. That was one of the worst shows of all time. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah, and it's a spinoff of The Family Guy. It just didn't work. Um, another good adult show that's awesome that's animated is Archer. I mean, Archer's oh great. Oh, my God. One of the best shows yeah. on TV right now. Like It's actually funnier than any of the sitcoms on CBS. I, I've actually said it's, it should get more love when it comes to award season. It just doesn't, and it should. It's so smart. It's so brilliant. And uh, people just don't give it a chance because they look at it like, are you kidding me? Just give it a chance. It's a really... F I also love Futurama. To me, that's just a timeless classic. Like, I, I was watching it last night, and you just forget how brilliantly written it was. It is brilliantly written. Um, I, I have a hard time with Fry. I'm not a big Fry guy. When you have fry. him in the center, it's kind of annoying. But I like a lot of their pop culture references, too. They're smart. And, you know, going back to Seth MacFarlane, his pop culture stuff is awesome. Yeah. But I've said sometimes, like, Man, like, I get that because this is what I do, but no one else is ever going to get any of this stuff. He, he's very arrogant. Of He's like, hey, I'm going to put it out, and if I like it, that's what I like, and that's what I'm going to put on air. Rather than you got to think about what the audience is going to like, too. Before I let you go, I want to get your take on this. Have you seen the movie Idiocracy? Absolutely. It's where we're heading. <laughs> right? Yep. I feel like Idiocracy has happened in 2015 when we keep talking about a poor lion that was shot. It's bad. I hate the dentist, whatever. <laughs> Puppets divorcing is a perfect example. What's that? With uh, Miss Piggy and Kermit getting a divorce. You didn't hear about that? <laughs> Idiocracy is literally a documentary. If that's news, dude, what's going on? Because when I first saw it like seven years ago, I randomly rented it from the library. I'm like, what the hell is this? It's by Mike Judge. I should like it. Back then, it was like my favorite movie. I've seen it about 20 times, so I'm sick of it. But it also gives me the chills because oh. that's literally where we are. The fact that Kim Kardashian is the most famous celebrity and the movie that everyone liked in there was called Ass and Idiocracy, yep. dude. 
Like, Won all the Academy like, Awards. <laughs> dude, it's getting bad. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, I always say if you watch the first, you know, 10, 15 minutes of that movie where they explain with the yeah. one couple and then the other couple, yeah. that's where we're heading. I mean, that is exactly where we're heading because, I mean, I hate to say it, the dumb people are breeding and they just don't care. I mean, if you go to a movie, they talk through the whole movies. They just don't care. It's so obnoxious and it just drives me crazy. They just talk and carry on conversations. And then they have little kids now that they talk through the whole thing and think it's okay. I never understood when it became cool to start talking in the movies. No one cares what you you know are saying or your opinion. You don't need to point out everything that you see on the screen. Sit there and watch the movie. Enjoy it. Laugh. Have fun and everything else. You know, Cheer, clap. Do whatever you want. Cry, but shut up <laughs> in the movies. I went to the Pete Davidson show last weekend in Ybor City at the Tampa Improv, and I had to sit next to these girls who were blackout drunk at a Pete Davidson show. I had to tell them to shut up three times before they got kicked out. It's like that was idiocracy to me. Why are you getting blackout drunk at a show where you're going to hear the punchline once? It's not like a movie where you can maybe watch it again. Whatever Pete Davidson says once is never going to be said that way again because a comedy show is different every time. So to me, that was idiocracy. The fact that I had to tell these blondes to keep their mouth shut. I had to keep saying, shh. And I was like, shut up. Like I paid 40 bucks to see Pete Davidson. I love the show, but dude, like you have a point. People are so rude now at these shows. It's like, shut up. Well, and I'm not this, I am not a guy that's like, Hey, these kids that need to get the belt. They don't yeah, get spanked. Yeah. I'm not that guy whatsoever. But I do think that there are some people that just were never disciplined for anything. And now they're not letting their kids be free and just let them do whatever. And it's just, you know, I've said it's creating a culture of a-holes, unfortunately. It's not everybody, but there's a lot of them out there, and they feel they're doing nothing wrong. And like you said, listen, Davidson was expensive. The movies can be expensive. Yeah. I mean, it really can. And to go to a movie and have someone sit and talk, you know, year through the whole way throughout it, and you, you can't do anything, it stinks. And the other problem is now we're all doing reserved seating at the movies where you, you pay your ticket. Okay, it used to be really easy. You go to the movies and sit down, and someone's talking behind. You, you know what I used to do? You don't confront them. You don't turn around and yell them. You pick up your stuff, and you move away from them. That's the easiest thing. It's not a chicken move. It's the easiest move to still enjoy your time yeah. and not look like an a-hole. And if you have a girl or somebody that says, hey, you should say something to him, you know what? Be quiet. No, you shouldn't because <laughs> you're the one that's going to get punched at the end of the night, not her. But obviously you can move away. But now with these reserved seats where you don't know who you're sitting by, let's say you sit down in an R-rated movie like The Wolf of Wall Street. Yes. And then a family comes in with a newborn and a four-year-old that should not be in this that movie. That happened when I and, saw that movie. And sits behind you. You can't move away from that. So you're almost you know, perpetuating the conflict to happen of why are you here with this baby at this movie? I saw a seven-year-old that went to Wolf of Wall Street. That's yeah, incredible. It's like, and listen, like, my dad took me to see aliens when I was way too young in the movie theaters to yeah. see it. But they were, you know, protective over certain things, whether it was nudity or just graphic beyond graphic violence. They weren't going to do that. But still, I mean, I just shake my head and just people who bring babies and little ones into the theater. Just have some respect for your fellow man. Yeah. Before I let you go, where can people find your work online and on TV? Well, you can find me on TV Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. on 44 in the Town. I have Entertainment Now, which is nice. uh, sponsored by Emerald City Comics. I do movie reviews. I'll sometimes do the four. Uh, you know, I've had my buddy King Felix, who's the clueless critic. He's the only movie, movie critic I like come on the show. <laughs> but I've had Drew on. Uh, I had some of the other guys on, Mo, Johnny, to come over and talk movies with me. Kale's come and done some reviews. Geo comes on a lot. That. So, yeah, I do that Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. on CW44. And then all my reviews on CW44.com and Twitter is at TM, the CW44 Critic. And then you can find it on Facebook, too. TM Pal, CW44 Media Critic. There was all that backslashy thing, but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> well, TM, thank you for coming on Happy Hour. This was a lot of fun, dude. I appreciate it. No problem. This has been Happy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, signing off. Peace out.